When I think of crossover between the digital art space on the blockchain and art in the museums, I usually think first of the work of Sabato. When I was at the Alta Pinacothek in Munich, I couldn't stop imagining his work on the wall in front of me in large scale. Today, we're welcoming Sabato to join us to share his latest thoughts on digital art, glitch, and technology. Artist Journal, June 7th, 2023, broadcasting live from Berlin and New York City on Rug Radio via Twitter Spaces. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and we welcome back co-host, artist, and conversationalist to the show, Runtoon. How is your week going? Busy as oh, ever. Glad to be here. I see, uh, I see Sabato, Sky Goodman. I see a lot of good faces. This is going to be a good, uh, good space. Well, I'm sure Sabato is going to attract a wonderful crowd. Uh, and yeah, so I am just absolutely thrilled. And I know what you mean about being busy. It's like the slight little pangs of terror are starting to sink in of, on the apartment search here. But I do have leads. So I am starting to feel a little bit more better about it. How about yourself? How's your week going, Runtoon? Oh, it's going good. Um, got together with a friend. Uh, yeah, it's my my dad visited over the weekend, so I got to hang out with him, show him around New York a little bit. Uh, drank a ton of wine on Monday. That was fun. Or not Monday. Sunday. <laughs> it sounds like a ton of looks <laughs> like a ton of wine. Red or white? Uh, both. Oh. oh yeah, I see. That sounds very fun. Do you have a preference? Oh no, I like it all. I mean, I work in wine, so I I'm someone who's around it, you know, 7 days a week. Wow. And so do you have a yeah. favorite red that you particularly like? I wouldn't say I have a favorite. I like exploring, you know, everything. Uh but what I had the other night was really fantastic. I was with a friend who's a sommelier at uh, this place called One White Street. Uh it's a cool restaurant in Manhattan. It operates out of what used to be the town home for John Lennon. Uh, so there's like a little interesting story there. But yeah, he was he was the one picking out the wines and I let him and he picked out very well. He got this uh, this Pinot Noir from Burgundy uh, from the Cote de Bomba, this producer called um, De Roy Gentil. And I'd never had this producer before, but it was just fantastic. It's just one of those really soft, ethereal reds that just kind of like goes down like some sort of spirit or ghost it's you know you describe the pinot noir uh perfectly i call it kind of silky smooth uh and yes. it is my favorite actually if like now that we're discussing it and i am not a wine expert but i know i love the pinot noir it is just such a like you say it's just uh like a ghost that enters your system mm -hmm. anyway i feel like i have an idea for a show which is rune tune as special guest and we discuss wine uh, but but today, <laughs> uh, let's talk to Sabato. Let's welcome Sabato. Sabato, I'm so pleased you came on and are willing to do this. I'm thrilled to talk to you. How are you doing? Hey, hey, Poco. Hey, Rune. Good to be with you all. It's a lovely day here in Western Mass. Um, I'm doing all right. Excellent. And How so the weather is better lovely. out in the Massachusetts. Weather it's nice. You know, actually, yesterday we had a weird day because of the um, wildfire smoke that's coming in from British Columbia. So, like, yesterday I, like, walked outside. It was, like, 9 or 10 a.m. And there was this, like, orange glow, like, cast on, like, the place I live and, like, the driveway and, like, the trees. And I was like, what's going on? And then I realized that the sky was, like, super hazy. So it was kind of a weird day yesterday. But today seems like it cleared up a bit. This doesn't smell like smoke. and weather's lovely that is incredible that it yeah. reaches that far <laughs> i mean my mom was mentioning it she's in saskatoon saskatchewan so you know it's not uncommon for there to be forest fires that kind of make their way over there but all the way to massachusetts all the way and i heard is ruined in new york get hit by the smoke yesterday oh it's horrible yeah it's wow. horrible yeah i can't be outside for more than 10 minutes without my eyes getting a little sore yeah yesterday was weird like it smelled like smoke like it was like there's a giant campfire except the campfire was canada you know it was like 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Canada is on fire. <laughs> so I was like, I don't want to stay outside too much, but but I'm glad that today is because I'm outside right now. I was like, so it's so beautiful. Like I kind of want to, you know, have this talk outside where, you know, I can talk loudly without waking anyone up and stuff. So, <laughs> well, yeah, and it's early in the morning where you are, I suppose. Yeah, it's not too early, but um, good. It's kind of like the end of the school year, so I think uh, like my family is kind of like being lazy and staying in a lot. So, <laughs> very good. And you know, one of the benefits of the uh, of the forest fires, if there is one, is the sunsets can be gorgeous. I I believe that. I should. I'll keep an eye out tonight. <laughs> I didn't look at yesterday cause, just because it smelled so weird. How well, I uh, the sun right now is like. It looks like it's supposed to be evening here, like it's a sun setting, but it's just the sun up in the sky. I can see it in my. Oh wow! Incredible. So New York, New York yeah. is still kind of in the in the thick of it. Oh yeah, yeah. It is spanning the continent. Well, Sabato, uh, enough of the pleasantries. Uh, I want to ask <laughs> you. Get uh, to it. How is the super rare application going? Oh, I'm not a. You know, it's <laughs> funny because I I I think I just like talking shit more than I like applying to super rare yeah yeah um personally i i have beef with the video application um i think i don't think anyone should be making a video to apply for mark for like that kind of platform um like here, here in the u.s there's like the the american against disabilities act like forbids like this kind of thing if you're applying for a job unless it's like an acting job um because it to me, it's like a vector for discrimination. So I, I just kind of against it, and I, I, I'll, I'll so, happily join Super Rare if someone invites me, but I'm not filling out an application. I didn't realize that the video applicate, the video acceptance thing was a requirement. You know, maybe it is, a, it, it but is. everyone says they made one. Um, I remember going uh, through the process, and I have to say that that is why I delayed forever more just out of self-consciousness at the time, because I had spent no time on video at that point. And I was just, I felt kind of weird about it, you know? And and maybe like on a deeper level, I did kind of have a sense of like, the sense of like, what is this visual thing about? Uh, like, I think, I mean, to be charitable, I suppose they're thinking this is a way of just kind of getting to know who this is. But it is kind of weird because there's so many anonymous accounts out there too. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm surprised to hear that they still have it actually. Yeah. I don't know. Like, and it's funny because like, you know, like of, of friends who applied and sent in videos, like I, I know, like, was it like Sam Faye made like a crazy video and then had to wait like a long time to hear back and like Lorna Mills made a funny video and then like, they never got back to her for like a year, at least a year. Um, so I don't know the whole, like that whole process to me just seems kind of, kind of iffy. <laughs> so, well it's a black box um, right like, it's a black or, box you know and so it always just kind of raises like who's deciding all this and everything i mean i have to say like it was thrilling to get in when i was so like early on and i kind of was just sort of i'd been making digital art for years and uh you know i'd known about it for a couple of years actually i knew super rare about super rare at least in 2019 like i don't know when they started and that was the biggest obstacle. I was like, oh, I mean, maybe on a certain level, I was like, oh, they'll never accept my art, blah, blah, blah. But I was also like, the video was the, like, I still would have applied, but the video really was mm -hmm. what delayed it for two years. Yeah. And then it was the uh, bull market in 2021 that really just, I was like, okay, the world's going to start banging on the door here. So I better get in while I can. I mean, it's smart. And, you know, you have a good video presence, you know, you do your journals and stuff. So. Well, thank I, you. I mean, it took, yeah, maybe a, <laughs> if you look, I, I looked at one of the earlier episodes. I can't watch any of them, basically, but I looked once earlier, like about a month ago, I looked at an early episode and it's much more muted. And it's almost like, uh, it's kind of funny. Like it does evolve over time, that whole, uh, you know, quote unquote presence. You have a great presence too, Sabato. Uh, well, as, thank you. As Runetune has sort of pointed out there in the, oh, in the yeah. tweet. So I well, appreciate it. So to get us going here, and welcome everybody who showed up. Again, I mean, it's just like an all-star cast here. San Diego, Sky Goodman, Mech.txt, Mikey De La Creme, Sean Luke, I mean, Ilya. It's like Dr. Version, Lily Illo, and on and on. Haiti Rocket. I mean, it's an all-star uh -huh. cast. So 
give us an update, Sabato. Like, I mean, I think the last time we had a kind of in-depth discussion on here was maybe in February, where like I still, uh, you know, I think Runetude might echo this. Uh, I learned a ton from what you were saying about Glitch. Like, it really did help illuminate. So give us an update on what you've been up to. I think you've, to me, like from over here, it seems like you've had a pretty wild three or four months. Is that fair? It's fair to say. It's been like crazy busy. Um, and I think around like in March, really April, like I got like a big moment of crunch where it was like the first time in my life as an artist where I had like multiple things kind of do at the same time. And I had to like stay up all night for like a week to get things done. Um, so that was, I mean, it, it's kind of cool like to just have that much work going so i was like you know just try to embrace it and, and do my best um and then the past like three weeks like it's been like the opposite because i think the market's been kind of a lot quieter than usual um so i've been like doing irl gigs mostly photographing and doing video for like college commencements and graduations and reunions and stuff mm -hmm. um so it it's been a lot of running around and and now what's going on now now I'm um I just started as artist in residence with this organization called Wild XYZ. Um and they do a uh they they focus on experiential art. Um and so I'm do I'm part of like a 10 week kind of like online residency program. Um where at the end of it I'll make some kind of like interactive experiential like virtual sort of art piece um i'm not sure yet what it'll be yet but I'm, i have ideas in my in my head and it's there's like a lot of like really cool people working with that organization that can help in terms of like you know putting together like a world in unreal engine um and kind of like helping design the interactivity and kind of like the gameness or the you know the, how, however your, the project is going to be so I'm really excited about that. There's some like amazing artists also in the cohort. Um, one of them is here, Sky Goodman. Um, I'm I'm really excited that that we're like in this together. Um, and there's a few other friends like uh, Riddell Warner is in it, Violet Forest, and and others. Um, I'm really excited to 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 see what we all create. And you know, it just started. So so I think like this is the first time I'm talking about it. Um, but, you know, as the weeks go on and I think as people's projects start to coalesce, like, I think you'll see a lot more of these kind of wild XYZ projects like pop up in the space. Well, it, it, go, so, go ahead, Rudy. I Maybe you said this already, but for this residency, for this wild XYZ, uh, it, I'm assuming there's a sh it culminates in a show. And when when is when is it going to be over or when when do you have a show? So it ends in a. Uh, I think it ends in September, like end of September oh, is when the wow, sessions that's end. Long, that's a really long residency. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's online, so it's kind of like once a week. You know, people join together. There's like a session, uh, um, and it's like every week there's like a, an expert. Like uh, um, this week we we talked to Wade Wallerstein and Sirwa. I can't remember her last name, um, but she does like incredible like afrofuturistic 3d art she's based out of australia um but yeah so it's like it's it's exciting and i don't think there's going to be like a physical exhibition like in a traditional sense i think there's going to be a lot of artists projects who are going to drop and i feel like these drops are probably going to be their own thing because they tend to be pretty kind of like big immersive sort of experiences um is it? Do you think a lot of the artists are, are are these projects dropping in the form of NFTs or you know that marketplace or is it yes. some? Okay, it'll be all like Ethereum based. Um, I think Wild has their own sort of platform to sell, but everything is is like tied to uh, it's tied to you know to Ethereum or OpenSea, so it's like it's still like accessible. Um, but from what I saw of previous projects, it would be like. You know, like they have their own website, their own thing. Um, a lot of them like require kind of like going into like a virtual space too as part of the project. So 
Just out of curiosity then, I, so this is a residence and do you have a lot of experience doing residences? Like I only learned recently, like, you know, two years ago that that is actually how you make your way up in the contemporary art world. If you're kind of starting out is you actually go to residencies and then, you know, curate, you have a little show and then curators get to know you and gradually you kind of work your way into the museums is actually how it works. Uh, so do you have a history with this? No, actually, this is my first artist in residency. So I'm like really excited about being able to put something like that on my CV. I, I can um, imagine. Like, I mean, I don't think I've yeah. ever done one myself. Like, and I only started applying. I, th I think I put in two applications and usually there's so much work to put like it's a full day of your life, at least to put in some application for a residency. So that's also yeah, and a lot of them ask for letters of recommendation, and it, like it's it, it feels almost like applying to a college. It, like it's it's a little, hardcore, a hundred percent. Yeah, it's hardcore. Yeah, yeah, like I was, and once you like once you start to understand that that's how the system works, and feel free to disagree if anybody thinks otherwise, but then you start to understand like, oh, okay, like yeah, especially the good residencies, like like you say, it's like applying for a job or college. Like it's kind of serious business because if you get in, it's kind of like social proof on steroids in some of these residences that's how i've that's always true. understood it and especially if you want it if you ever had your eye on specific galleries like they're probably not going to take you seriously unless they see on your resume you've got a few residencies under your under your you know on your experience um is yeah. that a surprise for you uh sabato or like is this something that you knew or is this something because it, it seems to me like you've been an artist for quite a while so, like, did you understand that that, or at least have an idea that maybe that's how things worked? You know, I, I did, um, just from what friends have told me. And I've, you know, had friends, like, list what, like, the three or four residency in, like, the Northeast U.S. that are, like, relevant. Um, but I think for me, it's, like, as a digital artist, and especially one as, like, I, I tend not to, I haven't had that much history making, like, site-specific sort of digital art. Um, for institutions. And I feel like if, if you don't have that kind of practice, it's really hard to land a residency um, because there's still, there, you know, there's very much that traditional art mindset. And I think when digital art comes into play, like they will think, they usually think like, oh, you know, digital art has to have like a very physical, very site specific component for it to be successful. Um, and I think this idea of like digital artists where we can, you know, just go and just kind of do our, our own thing in, in like digital environments is kind of like a new aspect of of residencies in and of themselves like in the past like five years i started seeing more like online residencies like or like you know where, where people like let you like take over like an instagram page or like a twitter and it's like you know you're you're right you're it's your resident quote unquote residency and then you you know can post whatever you want and share a project that kind of thing um i've been seeing more of these kind of like proliferate but i haven't you know, I haven't applied to many. Um, it, it, and so this is the first one. I'm just kind of happy. Like, it does sound like I, you know, from from what I see, it sounds like if you, if you are a wild XYZ residence, it's a kind of thing where, like, you do a project, then you come back and you teach a session next next season they have or you help with something. So they have, it's true, there is that kind of, like, you know, we, you've been a part of this program and now you can come back, you can help, you can contribute. Um so I definitely feel that. And I hope that, you know, that that's something that helps me grow my career and, and meet people and network and all that goodness. I'm sure it will. And I think it's really interesting what you say almost about digital art. Like it's almost like, like I was thinking about Tito's style when you said that, because she'll have, she's a you know, very prominent uh, contemporary artist based out of Berlin, actually. I think she works at the UDK or, or the, or the, I think that's the Academy of Art or whatever it is over here. And I saw her work in uh, Munich when I was there. And it's not just like a TV. It's like, you know, sandbags are like the couch. It's like a whole installation. And I almost feel like, you know, to your point, it's almost like the institutions, if you're not thinking about how it's going to work in the physical world, maybe it's, you know, it's not really taken as seriously in some quarters. I mean, just, I mean, I'm just speculating out loud here as I spill my coffee, but do you have any thoughts about that? 
No, I think that's very true. And um, the stuff that I have applied in the past, like I've applied to, what's it called? Um, I'm going to fuck up the names real bad. Um, But it's the Solitude. Was it FKN, Solitude? Um, They're out there in Germany. Like they have like a lot of new media sort of projects and residencies. Like a lot of their requirements were very much like had this, you know, if, if it wasn't physically site specific, it had to be like very like intensely conceptual. Um, and usually like they gave you a theme, like, you know, like solve global warming or like solve radicalization online. It was like very like intense social themes, right. That me as a digital artist, you know, like thinking about all these things, cause I'm like a poli sci nerd. It's still kind of like, you know, none of my work is like, you know, exists to like try to solve global warming. Like, I, I don't know. That's, that's like a really big ask for like one digital artist you know well and let, um, let's just let, so let, let me halt you there though because that's <laughs> fascinating and uh after that I'll, I'll pass over to runtune to ask some questions but what do you think about this whole idea of like in a sense i think the surrealists were fairly neutral from a moral perspective uh and i, I how do you feel as far as like in a sense art as a you know, a vector for political change, you know, of that sort. Let's say it's of, okay, we have to create awareness for uh, global warming uh, or, or climate change, whatever you want to term it. Like, how, how do you feel about that whole thing? Do you take a more neutral approach? Uh, do you sometimes have your issues that you want to push through your art? Do you push stuff through your art? I have. Um, I, I've done, like, you know, works about, like, immigration and, like, immigration rights. Um, because I was in that situation and it was just like, kind of like, I wanted to speak to my experience. Um, you know, it's, it's like, it's like a complicated question because, you know, a a lot of us have progressive political tendencies and like, I think these things do kind of shine through our art regardless of subject matter. Um, but I also think that like art in and of itself isn't an end in terms of politics. Like it doesn't necessarily trump like, collective action or like collective organizing or solidarity across groups um and i think like the actual kind of like political organizing that needs to happen like you know art's kind of tangential to it like maybe you know it it helps to kind of decorate these movements and like make things better but you know at the end of the day i think it's like if we want to kind of like affect change in terms of like having more sustainable world that isn't kind of like destroying the you know, destroying the environment everywhere. Like, I think these things come through collective action. Um, Like, I think, like, having art that is, like, too overly didactic and overly kind of, like, trying to, you know, hammer away these themes, like, can, you know, they they don't work on everyone. Like, I think you're kind of, like, preaching to the choir with a lot of these things. Like, people are going to gravitate towards it that already agree with you. Right. I, I, th- I think you put it beautifully with the uh, overly didactic. I, I have a friend who his joke when he goes to the gallery, his, his joke criticism is it's too didactic. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. And uh, I, I think you're right. Like, and that's the problem, right? From a aesthetic point of view, it becomes like you're, you're being preached to. And so sometimes that doesn't kind of, I, I almost prefer, you know, if you're going to have like a political, uh, you know, edge to it, which in a sense we all do to a certain degree. It's more about raising awareness than to than anything, you know. And maybe that's a distinction without a difference, but it feels a little different to me. The way I always experienced it when I was a student in art school was that, you know, you want your art to have some sort of meaning, and that time in everyone's life when you're a young student in a college somewhere and you're being opened up to all these new ideas, you become you know, that little political dial that's inside of you gets turned way up. And uh, what ended up happening with a lot of classmates of mine is they wanted to latch on to this sort of social activism (laughs) by, you know, imbuing their art with this social activism. So it has a lot of strong meaning, but then they Mm -hmm. ended up making a lot of bad art. And so it just kind of like was a car crash of two you know, two things that they were trying to achieve that ended up not really getting them anywhere because it became activism using art as the vehicle, but then the art wasn't any good. So it didn't make me want to take their activism very serious. 
Yeah. And th- yeah, that's the thing too. Like you see kind of clumsy attempts at art that are also like, you know, and again, like you agree with the message. It's like, fuck yeah, fuck racism, fuck colonialism, fuck all these things. But you know, if, if, if the art, sometimes you see art that is just like about that and you're kind of like, ah, <laughs> the art isn't right. that great. Well, and, and then you can't like, you feel you can't critique it much because you right. don't want to critique the message. And what I like um, about your work is that you do keep it close to your personal experience. And, you know, maybe I, I kind of want to say this just because maybe there's someone in the audience right now who is kind of like me, but you are someone who was always on my radar from a very early time getting into Twitter as like this place to kind of meet other creatives. And I would see you post stuff and your name became familiar. And it wasn't until that Twitter spaces we had much, you know, many, many, many episodes ago about the writer's influence. And you dropped all this incredible knowledge. And it was just, it was something where it's like, I had seen your art before, I always liked it. And I recognized you as this like multimedia artist, but hearing you speak and having all these really interesting ideas and this strong sensibility, it just was this kind of like powerhouse for me. and. Um, Anyone in the audience who hasn't listened to that episode should definitely check it out because there's a lot of a lot of good information there. Well, well, thank you. You know, it's I try to like I think my my approach usually like with the drawings, for example, I'll pick some kind of random topic and then make like a silly drawing, and then for me, like the subtext is what is where you if you want to delve into like the politics or the, um, you know, the meaning or even the didactic things. Like sometimes I'll like pick a subject matter that's like really obscure and then you kind of require like a little write-up like if i draw like a racing horse from the 1800s like no one's gonna know who potatoes was but you know that's why you have a little write-up write it out you know talk about the history of that horse and stuff um but i i like that that approach to it where it's like the surface is surface like it's very you know it's fine if it's fluffy if it's like exists just to kind of like attract the senses attract the viewers um get people involved but then like the subtext i think is uh is like where you know the people who who really resonates will look at that and then maybe that will like plant a seed um in them for something they'll do down the line they'll think of of whatever um i don't know you know it's it's an interesting question to consider like how does art actually influence the viewer and 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 how it influences people like i heard this quote by lenin vi lenin um, after he listened to Beethoven's, uh, I think it was his Appassionata Sonata, or was it the, I forget, it was like one of his piano sonatas. And he was like, if I listen to this every day, like, there's never going to be a need for a revolution. Um, and so I like wonder, <laughs> like, how, what kind of art is, has a narcotic effect where it like comforts people to the point where they're just like, you know, and what kind of art has a, an instigating effect where it makes people like want to do something. Um, I think artists like throughout the, throughout history kind of like have have wondered that like like Brecht that was definitely his his like approach to theater was like this idea that like you know if you show different forms of alienation either by the staging or by like the plot or the humor you can like put these seeds in people that like down the line they will you know they'll want to like have see help enact a little political change or or something. Um, <laughs> Fascinating. And if anybody wants to to join the stage here, feel free to put a request to speak and you can join the conversation here uh, with Sabato and Runetune. And Sabato, I have a couple of questions just on, I guess the first is on Glitch. And I mean, it's been around for, I I mean, you'd know better than I would, uh, but it seems like it's been around for at least, uh, you could probably trace it back decades, but where are we with Glitch right now from your perspective? I mean, it seems like with that Sotheby's show that you are in, uh, that we sort of, it kind of, I don't want to say it hit a mainstream, but it seemed to hit a bit kind of a new, kind of, you know, came out of the shadows into the light, out of the underground into the overground, so to speak. Like, what is your sense of where we are with Glitch right now? You know, I, I think, yeah, I think the Sotheby's thing was like honestly like a big win for the culture. Um, there was a lot of, you know, if you follow like the whole story of the auction, there was a lot of drama involved because, you know, at first it was like this one collector is like one collection that they were that they gave the Sotheby's to auction off, and then Sotheby's like created this, 
you know, the way they like marketed it was as this like, here we have this like the first glitch art show. It's all these pioneers. And then people looked at the roster and there were no women, there were no queer people. It was also very much limited to that collector's like interpretation of glitch, um, which focused on artists who kind of are Web3 native and who mostly do illustration based art, glitch art. Um, it was a first in many ways, in my opinion, where it was like you have this mega institution, Softbees, showing interest in an art like Glitch, but then also these Glitch artists and the people expressing their concern about the selection and Softbees pivoting and changing. And like that, that was pretty incredible, in my opinion. That was, yeah, I don't think anyone, any of us I, who ended up in the show expected that kind of turnaround. <laughs> I certainly we just didn't thought we were talking it. shit, you know, like yeah. we usually do. <laughs> right. Um, it was it was kind of funny because we're like a lot of us ha- are are used to being in this like shit talking mode on social media where we just kind of like, you know, we just like we see someone like have a glitch show and 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 say something that isn't true or that isn't representative of, like all of the glitch communities that we've been part of, and we'll point it out. Um, and I think that actually people listening and people being like. And this is also thanks to like you know the the artists who were in the roster who advocated to have a new show, um, and like getting like Dina and Danya on board to curate. Um, you know, I think there was like a big community response that was unprecedented that I haven't seen before. Like this kind of like solidarity. So, you know, I think despite all the drama. And, you know, still challenging the work with Sotheby's. Like, they are, like, a very commercial auction house. Um, they only care about, you know, their bottom line and stuff. And they take forever to fucking pay. I still haven't got paid for my, my auction. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rugged by so it's But me. this month, it should, it should come in. That's the middle, the middle of the month. But, like, it, it's, it's weird, you know? Like, why does it take so long? <laughs> well, if it takes any longer, you could always start shit talking on uh, Twitter. And I'm sure they'll <laughs> have to change course. <laughs> yeah i i mean i get why like you, you know you're if you're selling like you know million dollar pieces like it does i get it, it takes half an hour it's t- not half an hour it takes 30 days to clear well uh, a million dollar check right? we're not used to that <laughs> in web3 right we get used, used to that repaid. either you know it's kind of like the resurgence of trad you know trad art world in a sense uh as awesome as it is that you got on there too and you know what's funny just on that whole point like it it did seem like it was quite healthy at the end of the day and really the controversy i think just kind of you know it, it gave you know uh there's no such thing as bad publicity sort of thing like it, it turned out i think great for because that's all anybody saw on their timeline for a few days there was what's going on with this glitch show and it seems to me like uh you know just anecdotally it seems like your glitch work that you've been posting sabato it seems to be going pretty fast i i'd almost say surprisingly fast uh, in the sense that I remember you posting some glitch work, you know, six months ago, which didn't seem to run out the door as quickly, you know, like, mm-hmm. and not because of like, I was buying it, you know, but here it seems like it's moving faster. Do you get that sense as well? I did get a sense that there was a bump in just in just when I, when I dropped glitch, right? Like, I think there's more interest now. Um, and I think I've, yeah, I, I think that has helped. Um, just getting the, uh, you know, getting the, ra- rallying the troops, I suppose. And I don't know, you know, I, I don't know if anyone saw it. Rosa Minkman did like a spreadsheet of the sales of, you know, how the Sotheby show ended up being. And it was, what was wonderful about it is that it showed that like, you know, the, the artworks that were curated by the community, by Dina and Dania, uh, we all met our expectations or exceeded them. And then the original cohort, like they had a way less um, success rate in terms of meeting the uh, the Sotheby's estimates or exceeding them. Um, so I think it shows like there's a narrative that like, well, actually like curating, like community-based curation actually does produce more interesting work and better work and more supported work. And, you know, I think the reality is that most of the bids that we got came from our community mm-hmm. like i know some artists got like a cosmo bid and there were people who are outside the community bid but a lot of the bids you know they started off from from within kind of like the community and people who support the glitch artist community um 
But yeah, oh, I see. Sky I was here. just gonna say, yeah, Sky Goodman, welcome to the show. Thank you for your patience. Hi, Sky. It's... So glad you came. Thank you. I have to talk kind of uh, quietly because my four-month-old oh, is yeah. napping <laughs> next to me. <laughs> well, we can hear you loud and clear, Sky. So all is good over here. Welcome to the show. Where are you okay. calling from again? Perfect. I'm in Chicago. Oh, awesome! Of course, which uh, has a great history of of glitch roots, actually. Good. And what what are, what are your thoughts uh, on what we're saying here and about that whole glitch yeah. show and how it sort of it feels like it's kind of kind of it kind of I don't want to say it hit prime time because I don't know if it's hit prime time mm -hmm. yet, but it's like getting closer. Yeah, well, I was just thinking about how it tied into what you were talking about earlier with um, art and activism and collective action, because that was like a perfect example of uh, collective action, like creating um direct results like if the community if the glitch art community hadn't responded um with outrage and kind of get like almost a viral moment happening that then caught other people's attention and kind of snowballed i don't think um like so many other times i don't think anything would have happened uh we've seen so many other other times in the space where um people are misrepresented or there was an all male curation or this, that, and the other, and it doesn't attract enough atten attention and there isn't collective action. And then it's just, it just happens. And you got a lot of sad artists talking behind the scenes and DMs, but then nothing happens kind of on the public stage. So I felt like this was a really great win um, for the space and for us, those of us that have been in glitch, you know, for over a decade or more um to to say like wait a minute the show is kind of the curation is kind of bs and not representative of what glitch is about and I, and and for me it was more than just um it being an all male cast it it was it was that the show was not really representative of the varying styles of glitch and the history of glitch in the space like sabato said it was just one style web three natives and it kind of almost this revisionist glitch history where it's like almost as if glitch only existed since people came into the space two years ago when um actually there's this really rich history of glitch art that also spans all the way back to you know video synthesis artists and video video artists in the 60s and 70s um and uh and people like John Cage and Nam June Paik and uh, the Dadaist movement and all this other stuff, and it just felt like uh, I don't know, just just felt to me like a really good win that we were able to kind of have stuff to be stop, recalibrate, and then recurate and bring in people, you know, a diverse cast of characters, and pay people too. Like they pay Danya, they pay Dina. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was. And they lost, you know, I, I think it's great. They lost a lot of money because <laughs> during the, the first auction and the section auction, the NFT market totally cratered. So this wasn't, I, I don't think anyone intended of, intended this, but I think like as glitch artists, this is like the glitch art effect, you know, is that we managed to make a large institution lose some money and we managed to make our community get some money. So Exactly. You know, it's, it's a no. common criticism we hear, uh, Sky, about the in Web three is like you'll sometimes hear it with the generative artists as well, and just digital artists in general. It's like there was a digital art before you know blockchain, before Ethereum <laughs> was created, and you do kind of see, especially in the generative art uh, space, uh, you do see that criticism, and it, it almost seemed like it was kind of an mm -hmm. echo of of that sort of sentiment that it did feel very it was you know what it was it was almost like glitch was appropriated definitely it, it is yep. it, everyone kept calling this one style of art like flashing skulls glitch and it just was so confusing to me because it's it was like you wouldn't run around blasting like polka music and be like this is biggie smalls you know like there's <laughs> <laughs> just it's just not they're just calling it glitch and i'm like where did you even get this name from you don't know anything about this movement um how did the, how did this happen i don't I, know i think i know I, I have a theory on this and it's the flashing lights i think the flashing color 
is why mm -hmm. people think it's glitch because it's kind of glitching. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's mm -hmm. kind of too bad that the first stage for you know a mega institution to kind of give the world some glitch art was Sotheby's because it's really just an auction house. Whereas if it was something like MoMA or the Whitney or like a big museum, you could have had a little bit more of a didactic element in the show and something a little more informative. Well, th that's a great point. Like, has there, I mean, uh, Sabato and Sky, like, has there never been a proper glitch exhibition in like any sort of institution? Mm -hmm. Like, that sounds almost hard to believe. Like, is that true from your has has Chicago ever done anything? Because I know you were speaking mm -hmm. to that earlier. I'm sure the Chicago Art Institute would be a great platform for something like that to emerge. Yeah, I mean, I know that, you know, the School of the Art Institute is here. And um, John Cates, who is um, really active in, in Tezos and the Web3 space, um, used to be the head of the media and animation department was the chair head of that department at SEIC for many years and then left academia and is focusing solely on art. But he's been a glitch artist since the 90s, he's also a good friend of mine. And um, so I know that he has done a lot of work in Chicago, like in connection to um, SEIC. And then um, there's a theater, movie theater here called the Gene Siskel, which is also like funded by the Art Institute. So John was able to present his Glitch Western, which is like, I think the first feature length film made of Glitch. Um, it's incredible. And so that was like a full house and he gave a Q&A there. Um, I know that, th that he's also co-curated an another exhibition in Chicago that kind of looked at the history of Glitch and video games, but there's nothing, there has nothing been uh, properly done in the Art Institute itself or in the MCA, which is like our little MoMA. Um, and I and I, I also do know that back in, it might have been, I don't know if it was 2015, um, maybe Sabato remembers, but the Tate in London had a, a little glitch exhibition. Oh yeah, and, um, I had a work. Both Sabato and I were in that and also Tooks, yeah. I, I think. Is and, there a, sorry to interrupt, I, the, do you hear what I hear? Uh, do you hear beeping? Yeah. Sorry, there's like a, a big ass truck pulling into my driveway. <laughs> it's a glitch. <laughs> we have a glitch. In our... <laughs> um, <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> um, okay, there, it, I think it disappeared. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry, where were we? Where were we? Oh, just I, oh yeah, just the institutional representation. Yeah. Like, well, and you know, it's just like to add to the point, we don't need to belabor it, but it's sort of like they keep showing the same 30 artists over and over and over. They have a Gerhard Richter show here at the Neue National mm -hmm. Galerie, and it's like, you'd think they'd be jumping on something like this and just going, here we go, people, we have something fresh for you at last, mm -hmm. you, know, you know? That would be fun. Yeah. Still waiting. Still waiting. But Still waiting. I guess which you know, it's always it's it's um yeah, it comes from the underground, but I guess to be in Sotheby's is to not really be that underground anymore. So I guess it's time for a museum to do a big show. I agree. I, I think there has been like shows that are about glitch in museums. Like actually it's funny, um the Hudson Mocha had a show that was like had a theme of glitch that was curated by Legacy Russell back in 2018 2019 um but it was it was interesting because i don't think like i submitted work and it didn't get chosen and then from what i saw like a lot of the works chosen were mostly like traditional paintings or very physical physically based artworks um and then i thought and you know it was it was again it was it's one of those things where it's like i think un until there still hasn't been a glitch show where it's like, let's do a survey of the different glitch communities. I feel like a lot of them tend to focus on like either like, you know, the curator's interpretation of the, you know, the subject matter, or it's like one specific community, um, like the artists who came from kind of like an academic background, you know, from the 2000s, like they definitely, I feel like they've gotten shows with each other together. Um, but I feel like for artists that are came into glitch like after that like through the glitch artist collective or through web3 or through like tumblr or whatever 
Like, I think a lot of us haven't had that moment where an institution was like, let's get all these different communities and kind of do a survey and see how, you know, how different people approach the topic. Because it's, it's not just like different online communities, it's also different parts of the world. Like South America has their own histories. And, you know, if you if you go to like Asia, you would find that too. So yeah, there's a rich, you know, I think there's a lot of potential. Um, there's a rich glitch community that's come out of Iran, um, Argentina, there's, um, I know, there's like a lot that happens just in Zagreb, Croatia as well, like a whole kind of subculture of glitch came out of out of there and um so yeah there's a lot to explore it'd be great sabatu and i before web before we got into web3 we talked about actually creating this massive textbook of a survey of glitch art of uh, across all continents and and countries but then we got sucked into this (laughs) this space and then we started making money (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you guys should totally do that, by the way. I was almost thinking while yeah. you were describing all this, it's like it's almost like it needs to come from within. You know, if you don't tell your own story, the someone else is going to tell the story. And uh, do you guys have any thoughts? Like John Cates, I don't think, made it into the auction. Do you guys feel like, was that like sort of uh, something that got missed by accident there? Or uh, I guess not everybody can make it in, but it was kind of... Uh, it seemed to me like he was an obvious person to kind of throw in the auction there. Yeah, I don't know exactly the decision making process of the curators. Um, sure, and I, I don't want to put you guys I, on the spot. Either. But I do know that they were just limited with the amount of people that I think I think Danya and Dina could bring in an extra six people. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's just like, there's just only so much space. I was just wondering. Yeah. Oh, and I know there were different people who got thrown around and then still didn't, you know. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Like Lovid was supposed to, was originally included, but I don't think they were able to finish a piece in time mm-hmm. with the crunch. And, stuff. and there was talk about Jamie Fenton um, also being included, but, um, but and maybe it still was hard to bring in people who aren't as active in web three. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Sab- Sabato, I, I want to just, uh, there's a question I want to ask you too, just on this idea that you make all these different series and I think you do fairly well at that. Like it's, it's a challenging thing to do sometimes for an artist to kind of have these different styles. And so I'm wondering, like, do you have a philosophy about that? Because from uh, d- indirectly, I'd say they actually do have quite a consistency conceptually there's a style but it's not overt uh, but it's almost like you can tell uh i might not be able to tell that they're the same artist without knowing that ahead of time but once you do you go yeah that makes sense that this is uh the same artist do you have any uh thoughts on this idea of doing different kind of series it, it tells me that you're kind of a somewhat of a conceptual artist in how you approach things yeah you know honestly i think from my point of view, it, it might come from like a pragmatic like thing because, you know, if I'm working on a series, I think I'll get to a point where sometimes I just get burned out on making the work for the series. And I need to like, you know, kind of change gears and do, you know, do a different approach or work on a different media just to kind of like rest from the previous one. Um, like I think a drawings is a good example because, um, like I can't actually just keep making drawings nonstop because my hand hurts, you know, just like something about drawing with a mouse. Like it's not always comfortable. And so when that happens, I'm realizing, like, Oh, my hand's starting to hurt. Like let's, let's do some data bending. Let's like play with video and play with other media because you know, it's a different process. And then it's, I feel like I'm operating on a different level and kind of like it, it like allows me to rest from, you know, the drawings are from whatever series I was like working really hard on. Um, and I think this idea of like, kind of like bouncing back and forth is more of just like, how do you keep sane while maintaining these series that you kind of want to continue for a few years at least, or you want to just like build out into like their own kind of like bodies of work. I, you know, this is something that I've responded to as well with your work. And so I'm glad you bring this up, Poco Belly, because, um, I think something that we all like to see in in NFTs and in this digital art community that's so vast is to see someone who uses a variety of tools. um, And you're exactly that person. 
And, you know, I, my whole experience uh, is in academia and with galleries and institutions, they expect you to be very, very cohesive. Um, if you're a painter, you do mostly only paintings. Um, even sometimes a gallery wanting you to stick to a certain color palette and not breaking outside of that or a certain <laughs> subject matter. And you're not allowed to like kind of go off from that. Otherwise, you're completely subverting what your work is for the audience they perceive to, it to be. Uh, and so it's always nice to see that you're doing so many different things from pixel to glitch to AI to post photography to regular photography. You know, it's just like, it, it's, I've, I've always wondered that about you. It's like, how do you identify as an artist? Because it's so easy for someone to be like, well, I'm a painter and I do painting. And sometimes I do drawing or printmaking. And yeah, I mean, I know it like on your, you, you call yourself like a new media artist and photographer, but like, like, what do you tell people when you like meet someone for the first time and you're out with friends at a bar or something? I mean, I guess it depends what kind of friends. Yeah, I suppose that's true. It depends on the friends. I love it. Well, it, you know, I call them process machines. Like to me, it seems like you have these different processes that you put together and like, it's kind of like Warhol. I mean, it has this process and then you explore that process and what that machine, that conceptual machine can do, whether it's using the, uh, you know, deluxe paint or making, you know, disturbing a JPEG or these yeah. other works, you know, what uh, does that Right, and I'm saying like glitch you? art, like saying someone I'm a glitch artist is like for, you know, for people within new media circles, they'll get it. But I think like for a regular person, like they'll be like, what, what does that even mean? Um, so I just, so I, just, I think yeah. for, for me, like one of the, so Pocobelli was talking about how, you know, amongst this wide range of like images and tools that you use to, to create art, there is like a common thread. And for me, it's like this shared experience we all have with like digital things, whether it's like internet stuff or video games. Uh, and <laughs> one of my experiences was very, very early on when I was like kind of new to Tezos, I was just like exploring a ton of art on object and just diving through wallets. And I was very bad at like, like clicking the follow button. And it was one of those things where like I would come across art that was like that at the time I was just like it was entertaining to me. But then it just like the idea the the image just stuck in my head and I'd go, oh, I got to find that artist again. I, I just I have to see that collection again. And it would have been like something that I saw a month ago. So there's no use in trying to like use the history or any of that to to locate the artist. And that happened with you once where it was your Echo the Dolphin series. Oh my and God. You know, it's just another one of those examples of like that one, for whatever reason, really spoke to me because of this like shared experience of like, you know, clearly I'm I'm assuming you have an experience playing Echo the Dolphin because why oh, else yeah, would yeah. you have made that series? <laughs> and so I was trying to find it for one thing to like enjoy it for myself, but to show it to a friend who doesn't really, you know, look at digital art a whole lot. And just I was I was going to use it as something. But I remember even making a tweet being like, can anyone help me locate this artist that did a whole series on glitching Echo the Dolphin, please? <laughs> and I just, I, it's, it's, it's funny how it's that shared experience of digital media that kind of, for me, is like the common thread in a lot of your work. Yeah, and it's true. I, I had Echo as a kid. Like, I got it as a Christmas present and then couldn't get past, like, the first level because it's such a hard game. And then... <laughs> didn't play it for like 10 years until I was like in high school and then had like, you know, you're like in high school and you're bored and then you play all your old games for whatever reason. And then I got really into echo and because I was older and I could like, I had internet too. So I could like look up how to get past things. I could look up like the passwords to skip levels. <laughs> like I managed to beat the game. And then I was like in love with the game because it's so beautiful. Like there's so much to that game that i think people kind of missed out on like those sprites and the levels and like the music and i think like when i when i first started glitching game roms echo was the first one that came to my mind because it's like it's an obscure game not a lot of people liked it but it's like an incredibly beautiful game so i was like this has to be 
have to glitch it. And then what I found out is that like I can't stop glitching it. Like if, if like a lot of games when you glitch it long enough, like you kind of see repeating patterns. And you do see that with Echo, but I think there are aspects of how the game is designed. Like there's like a sandbox level and there's like different elements that come into play in ways that are always kind of like unique and you know like surprising i'm still surprised by the glitches i see in echo and that doesn't happen with a lot of video games do you do you recall what made you want to start glitching video games uh in the first place was it did you just see someone else do it and you had to you just had to like play around oh yeah it was cory archangel and super mario clouds which is like a classic um that was my um that was my first kind of like exposure. I mean, honestly, the first exposure is you're playing games yourself and it glitches and then you're kind of like, haha, that's cool. Sure. But, that, that makes sense. Um, but and yeah, also, Dark you know, was an inspiration. Danya Darkstone also glitched. I think she did a, she, she did some game glitches that were really great. And, um, this other artist, Jordan Bortner, I think he went by JPEG stripes back on the Tumblr days. Um, and he was also like, you know, kind of influential, like seeing him kind of glitch games and stuff. Don't drive away, Sabato. Don't drive away. Oh no, it's it's because I'm outside and it's like I'm hearing all the cars. I feel <laughs> like you're about to say goodbye as you drove off into the landscape. No. <laughs> uh, Slime Brands, thank you for being so patient here. Uh, who had their hand up? Welcome to the show. Where are you calling from? I'm in Dallas, Texas. This is Curtis, by the way. So Curtis. it's just because. Oh, welcome, Curtis. Yeah, yeah, this was Rune Tune wouldn't quit talking. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of, Andy also stole my question. That's what I was kind of thinking uh, as you guys were talking. I, I was wondering about inspiration because when you guys were talking about a common thread amongst the work, I feel like that's something that a lot of artists struggle with when, you know, you, you, you learn these tools, you learn the history of art, and then you get in there and you start making. But finding a style that y you're happy with and also that you want to, you know, get, stay in that cut in the focus and run with it, I think is really difficult for a lot of people. So I was kind of wondering what were your inspiration, like what were your aha moments where you were like, okay, this is, th this is for me and this is what I want to continue to make? That's a good question. Um, I think because my, a lot of my work starts from the point of glitch, like a lot of my aha moments are I would say process based, like you figure out like one, one way to break an image or one way to glitch something or an approach, you know, you find a new format or something. Um, those are big points of inspiration for me. But then it's like, the question is, it's like, you have the process, like what's the next step, which is, you know, coming up with a concept and trying to figure out what kind of imagery you want to explore. And honestly, like I, like when I started making glitch art, my approach was like, very simple it was like i had a process and then i'd pick random photos that i thought looked cool or had interesting colors or compositions and i would just kind of put them through the process and see what came out it was very experimental it wasn't as like conceptually coherent as i think like over time you just get better at that um not so i think there's like that it's kind of like that old proverb where it's like big part of inspiration is like perspiration and i think a big part of it is just kind of getting yourself forcing yourself to be consistently in that process of creating right even sometimes when you don't have necessarily have the best idea or you don't have like you know the answers or you feel like you're not quite there with your aesthetic or your own style like i think the best thing is just to keep going keep kind of doing even if you're making art that you think is bad like just keep making I it like it's better to have something made and to revise it or even throw it away than it is not to have made it in the first place. So I think like, you know, you, you just got to keep going and you got to trust in yourself and, you know, see what's around you too. Cause I think like with time you find, you find like where you want your place to be and what your voice, you find what you want your voice to be as well. That was beautifully put Sabato. And I totally agree with you. Like I used to be sort of this quality over quantity, of course, but no, now I'm actually quantity over quality. Uh, which is kind of a Copernican revolution because I wasn't making any work. And now it's like I'd r much rather mm -hmm. be making a lot of work that maybe I have doubts on or whatever than to be, you know, a perfectionist and uh, trying to get this perfect thing, which is not a great place to be, actually, I'd argue, as an artist. One thing I wanted to mention about all your work, 
though another kind of quality that I think uh, has not been discussed is I think you actually have a very, there's a very aesthetic side to your art though. Like it's not just purely process. It is like, it seems like you're breaking things, but then you very are, uh, very much are about the this kind of beautiful result. You know, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I I think you're right. Like for me, like the the aesthetic, kind of like the ineffable experience of art, like this idea of like you know trying to reach the sublime or trying to like, um, you know, when you create something that you that it has to be beautiful. Like I think it's like. I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain it because to me, it very much touches on these ideas that are like ineffable or like unspeakable, or you're trying to communicate things that you can't necessarily communicate with language. Um, I think that's a big part of it. And I mean, I was, you know, growing up, I was really inspired by cinema, by like, you know, by, by just movies. And my favorite films are the ones where the cinematography is just like gorgeous throughout and the visual language of the cinematography speaks to you know how the movie develops you know it gives like another layer of meaning to the film um like great examples would be like uh you know chris marker's la Jete, which is made entirely out of photographs and each photograph is fucking gorgeous or like you know antonioni's films um like zabriskie point is a good example i think because it's not a great film as a film, but it's a film that communicates everything it needs to just through its visual language. Um, and I think that's really cool. And that was always something that like moved me. And so when I create art, when I make art, I like very much think it's like, I need that like visuality to be there, you know, independent of everything. Like, I think if, if it has that thing where it kind of attracts people and brings in the viewer and viewers are like, Oh, this is, this has an aesthetic you know, complexity or something about it that they respond to. I think that's, that makes the art successful. Sorry, I have a question. I Not to de derail from uh, this particular topic, but you're talking about film now. And I remember from conversations past, you said that you wanted to go to school to be a filmmaker, but ended up studying uh, political science. Is that right? Instead? That's correct. Yeah. And so like, at what point did you, at what point did you like become an artist or think of yourself as an artist or start making art is this just it was that something that you'd always done well i've always like drawn i've always been creative like i think like there's a point where i wanted to be a cartoonist you know um yeah. and then i wanted to be a filmmaker and then i went to college but the college i went to didn't have a proper film program um and then i you know, I, I had like an immigrant kind of like the immigrant story where it's like I grew up, I wanted to be an artist, but because, you know, you're an immigrant in the U.S., like you're not allowed to be. It had to be like a some kind of job where I made money. Um, and didn't, part of me, I, I'm, I'm having was like thought. studying something that made money and it didn't go well because I flunked out of college when I was studying to be a biology. I was studying biology and I flunked out of organic chemistry and biochemistry. And then there was a moment, like a semester, where I wasn't going to school, but I couldn't tell my dad that I flunked out. So I had, I made up this like double life. Um, and I like was able to launder my tuition money and like get myself an apartment and buy myself a digital camera. And that's when I like decided, I was like, well, I really just love art. And that's kind of like that semester where I flunked out, I like taught myself digital photography. And I like got to drawing because I used to draw cartoons and I had a friend who was like, Sabato, I love your cartoons, but why do your characters look like the Simpsons? And, you know, she was so spot on with that critique that I was like, I cannot draw the circle eyes like the Simpsons again. I need to develop my own style. <laughs> so, and so that moment where I flunked out was like the decisive moment where I was like, all right, you're going to be good at this now because you're obviously not fit to be a science student. Cause you don't want to do homework. You know, you just want to party. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's hope there for That's all these amazing. kids that do fail. Cause now a lot of us, you know, yeah. there are kids around and yeah, they fail through school and it's nice to actually hear stories that, well, it all turned out in the end. It turned out. And I, I grabbed my degree. I came back, you know, I, I, I unfailed myself and like barely got through, but got my degree and 
I just wanted to jump in to say that I'm in the same school as Sabato and had to fail and unfail myself and didn't want to do homework. So well, I don't know what kind of school of art that is. But. You know, I don't think I did homework ever. Like, I don't, like, maybe once, you know, like, I never, ever did my homework. And it's kind of a miracle that I got through everything. Like, I mean. That's amazing. Yeah. Like, it's kind of, and we've all found each other. Yeah. <laughs> So, Santiago, uh, I see you have, thank you for coming on stage. It's great to hear from you. Calling from Uruguay, Santiago, welcome to the show. Hello, friends. Hi, Poco. <laughs> Hi, Ron. Hi, Sabato. How are you doing? It's dude, I'm doing even better now to, uh, we're hearing from you. As we wrap up here, we'll start to wrap it's... up. But, but yeah, go for it. How are things going with you? Yeah, it's great to to hear you guys. Uh, I I love Sabato's work, of course, and I agree very much on what he said about uh, overly didactic art or kind of uh, art that says too much. Or, uh, and I stand in, in a similar place, but I want to ask about a particular piece that I love and that has some political component in it. That is this waiter that went as an open edition on foundation. I'm very curious about what you have to say about that piece because I love it. And I think, for example, that the motion in the in the walking of the waiter shows so much the, the effort of a day of physical work. It's beautiful and very deep to me thank you so much i i'm it means a lot that that work resonates with you and you know i'm a huge fan of, of your work and practice as well like i feel like i feel like i don't have enough money to collect all your works because i love so many of them and then like your experiments with like creating drawing tools and like exploring different like tools themselves i think it's always like a pleasure but um with with Garcon, I'm happy you, you know, I think you read it really well. It is very much about kind of like the toll of labor. And also I think it's like, you know, it is about, you know, the service industry and being like, just kind of like, you know, doing that work day in and day out. Um, and the way the motion, the way I, I kind of designed the motion was that I wanted the, the, the hand holding the cups to be really still and non-moving. But then I wanted the, the robot, the character's motion to be kind of jaggedy and to be kind of messy. Um, it actually came out cleaner than I was hoping. Like I wanted it to be even more like all over the place than it turned out. Um, but the idea was kind of like to have that contrast between like the really still hand that keeps the glasses like perfectly well. And then like the body, which was like totally chaotic and like totally going into overdrive, doing everything possible to keep that facade of like, you know, perfect service of, um, you know, the, that, that like aura you get like at a fancy restaurant. Um, and I think, you know, as a South American, I don't know if it's like common in all of South America, but like in Brazil, for example, like it's really common to like, you know, if you're for the, like the, the restaurant patron to be really demanding on the waiters, you know, like, especially if bougie, I've known that bougie people in Brazil, they ask for all sorts of like absurd things from waiters. Um, and I kind of wanted to get that, like, that element. Because I feel like in Web3, a lot of us are kind of that, we're kind of those garçons, we're kind of the waiters. Um, you know, we always have to be serving this, like, beautiful art. And, you know, it's I've noticed that it's a space that it, when you do create and you do drop something that's good, like, the space usually responds, like, um, responds to that. But then, like, this effort of always having to produce something that's good, like, it takes a toll. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you're, like, going crazy in the background you know, you're like fighting with family or like, you know, you're like having a meltdown or you're just sick or you have COVID or God knows what. And, but you're still like trying to create something beautiful and trying to put something that has that veneer where you're like, I'm an artist. I make things all the time. I just touch something and it becomes beautiful. But you know, the truth of the matter is, is that there's a lot of like physical effort and emotional effort and it can be hard. I'm so glad I asked this. I, I love what I shot here. It's an awesome question. Thanks so much. I, I'm good. Thank you, Santi. Yeah, it, that was a great question. And, you know, one 
quick question on a work that I completely missed here, the remixed Fabulous Monsters. I was it's like looks like a trading card. It's gorgeous. I've never seen it. It looks like a collaboration here with Pearl Hyakinth. Have you ever thought about doing trading cards? Because that would be unbelievable. Oh my god. You know, it's funny, like I I I I think it's like I don't know, you know, I've thought of it, but I I haven't yet. Um I think we're up in a Brazil like it's a Brazilian there's like a Brazilian kind of aspect to like growing up with trading cards. Like when I was a kid there was a there was a card game called Super Trunfo. And it was basically like if you can imagine Pokemon cards, but like it's with cars. So it's like you have like, you know, a card with like a a Fiat sedan, and then you have another card with like a Ferrari. And you basically just like Pokemon, you kind of put cards down and then it's like the car that's fastest wins or something. <laughs> um yeah, you know, I've thought of it. Like, I think card games are just, you know, they're such a part of, like, growing up, too. Um, but I don't know. Um, the the piece with Pearl Hyacinth with, um, I think her, her IRL name is Melody Owens. She's an artist down in Australia. And she was doing these, like, augmented reality collaborations with different artists where she would do a collage. And then if you hold your phone over the collage, like, this other artwork would appear. Um and that's kind of what this work is. It's, uh, you know, there's an augmented, augmented reality from Melody's original collage, where if you like, hold, you know, look over it with your phone on the, I think you use, the app is called iJack. If you look, look over it with your phone, like my work would appear, my drawing, and it's kind of like, they're very similar. Um, but I haven't, I haven't actually listed it yet. I was planning on doing it maybe later this week or early next week. Um, I was just kind of waiting for the right moment to, to list it. And you know what else I love about it? it? <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry to interrupt. I, no, you're I, what I love about it, maybe one of the things most of all is you have like tiny dithering in one area, but then it's like you have on the top, you have like big pixel dithering. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like in the background, you have kind of, it's like this, it feels like really small one pixel dithering. It's, and then, Yes. That looks, I'm just in love with when I see that. And I've seen a few other artists just like in totally different ways. Uh-huh. I think Kappen had something where it was like really big pixels with small pixels. Uh, it's beautiful. And like these, yeah, you could have like a total trading card, you know, digital art kind of with this deluxe paint. Uh, you know, it just feels like a t- Yeah. Fine. Anyway, on and on I could go. But, you know, that was Photoshop, like, because I had the like, resize you know the lux paint you export you have very specific sizes because of like just the software's native resolution and Mm -hmm. all that um but with a project like this it's like i have to size things based on melody's specifications for her ar app so you know the it was a little tricky because if you you know if you ever played with pixel art you know that like you really kind of have like you have to size at certain intervals otherwise the pixels get all like Mm -hmm. Um, and so like part of it was just me making big pixels because I could just stretch those, you know, the still art out. Um, and then with the animation, it's like, well, you have to keep that at a specific size. So the animation will look crispy. Um, super, but I, you know, the fact that that stuck out, that's definitely something, you know, I should be exploring more. just kind of like playing with these different resolutions. Well, I, I totally agree. And it, it's something that I, I just yeah. think it's so powerful. And again, it's almost like by putting it in Photoshop, could, because I noticed at the top, there's no movement in the image. And it's probably because you had to, you know, put it in Photoshop. And so anyway, it's just super fascinating. It's a gorgeous work. I hope to collect that. So as we're wrapping up here, Sabato, uh, what's next? What's next? Um, You know, that's a good question. I'm, I guess... I feel like I never know how to answer that. Uh, I mean, I'm working on the residency. Um, what else have I got coming on? You should put show or collab. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just or a few days ago, um, I minted this collab with Sky Goodman, um, and this was a this was actually work that we made for an IRL exhibition. It wasn't designed for NFTs, which is kind of like lately has been kind of the exception rather than the rule but um yeah so the work is called spafis solutions it was for a show called spacor which was held in chicago at the Co- Co- prosperity gallery in april 
And the exhibition is centered around this idea of like, you know, let's look at wellness capitalism at like this culture of like, of wellness and how it relates to labor and how it relates to kind of like the endless and precarious labor we have to do. Um, but then let's look at it in kind of like a funny, campy, kind of like horror film style lens where everything is like terrifying and absurd. Um, and so the exhibition was held in April. It was, it, it went over really well. There were like about 40 artists from around the US showing. Um, and then Sky and I had a collaboration, which was, um, it's a video work. It was created in a, in a, in, in the 3DO game. Um, what's it called? Um, Life Stage Virtual House. And what I did is I created these spaces that kind of like mix like kind of like a spa with tubs and like kind of like resting areas and then put like all these screens. like, And then in the screens, I composited Sky's incredible video art. Um, and then I just kind of, you know, kind of created this like short two minute sort of walkthrough through these spaces that are very like spa like, but also like have a lot of screens. Um, with Sky's work, I, I think the idea is kind of like creating these environments where it's like you have to rest, but you also have to work at the same time. And it's interesting because what I found is that people's reaction are usually like, oh, this actually sounds wonderful. But I'm like, well, no, this should be terrifying because you should just be sitting at the tub without the screens. But, you know, it's such a part of our lives now where it's like you don't you, you want it's like you want the. You want the chains to be there. Yeah, it's almost <laughs> like so there's a there, there's a sense of uh, <laughs> a lack of something if we don't have a screen around that somehow we're missing out on what's going on. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, Sabato? Any final thoughts for anybody or everything or anywhere? Ooh, no, I'm I'm really bad at final thoughts. Okay. Um, just be kind to everyone. Be kind to each other, I guess. And you know. Um, drink a lot of water. I love that, actually, because you know what? Th those are actually two really good final thoughts about it. It's a nice work there. Anybody else <laughs> on stage there? Uh, any any thoughts and rune tune? Any final thoughts for us? Oh yeah, it's just been such a pleasure following you, Sabato, over the last couple of years and kind of seeing what you're into and learning about those things. The spa core video that you shared yesterday, or maybe it was a few days ago, I'm not sure, but I saw it last night. And you're you're always someone I like to follow. You always have interesting things to say and share. So thank you. Thank you, Rune. Thank you, Poco. Also, thanks, Santi and Sky for coming on board and Curtis too. Um, thank you all. And I'm I'm seeing like some a lot of homies here in the in the audience. Shout out to Tooks and Mac and Mikey, Evelyn, Ed Marola, Martin Joe, Sean Lu, Gilia, Dr. Version, Art Deft, uh, Mental Noise. You know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot. You don't, I can't name you all, but I love you all. And <laughs> thank you for showing up and for being a part of this. It was awesome. And I totally agree with Rune. I think you really add something to the space and I'm, I'm thrilled also. Yeah, I've been excited about your work since I first saw it when I landed on Tezos. Uh, it took me about one session. It was the basketball, the hand in the basketball net. It was an early drawing work. Oh Remember God. that? And you know how I discovered it was actually through Haiti Rockettes uh, collection because I, oh, I was buying Haiti Rockettes work, which is kind of the, one of the first things I got into. And so anyways, yeah, you bring a lot to the space and thank you for doing this. And thank you everybody who came on stage and thank you everybody who came and showed up to listen. Thank you, Sabato. And thank you once again, RuneTune for co-hosting and doing a wonderful job here. Until next time, everyone take care and I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you, y'all have a good day. Thank you.